Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Maryland Native Plant Society's webinar on diversity of a serpentine grassland at Bear Hills Barrens with William Hillgartner, PhD. I'm Ann DeNovo. Our speaker this evening, he is a paleoecologist, naturalist, and teacher. He's an adjunct faculty member at the Johns Hopkins University Engineering for Professionals Graduate School. He has taught plant and bird ecology, geology and evolution at Friends School, Johns Hopkins and MICA. His research has focused on macrofossil seeds of plants in rivers and wetlands, as well as vegetation of serpentine barrens. His earlier research concerned fossil birds of the Bahamas with the Smithsonian Institution. He has two sons and three grandchildren and lives with his wife, Marilyn, and two cats in Baltimore, Maryland. So with that, Bill, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Okay, good evening. Uh, great to be here and to have an opportunity to present the, uh, the plants uh, at Bear Hills. I do want to thank uh, Marnie Bruce and Anne DeNovo and the Maryland Native Plant Society for inviting me to, to give this presentation. So this presentation, um, or in this presentation, I want to uh, go over a number of several things. Um, the study site, in other words, where I've been looking at these plants, um, the geology, uh, to give you a little bit of a background of the, of the area. Um, we'll have a, I do have a list of some of the herbaceous species and um, you know, also the grass and sedge species. <clears throat> in particular, um, I have a, I'm going to present about 15 uh, photos and ecology of about 15 of the plants that are particularly interesting and important. Um, uh, brief data about quadrats, which I'll explain a little bit later there um, on that in succession. Um, there was an interesting burn area adjacent to the site uh, last year, year and a half ago, and I've sort of followed that, uh, and I'll have a few slides of that. I want to talk a little bit about invasives. And, uh, and then uh, some insights I've gotten from after looking at these plants for 20 years. Um, and then also a few slides to present uh, an ongoing grassland restoration site that we have in another part of the park. So why study the plants in a plot on Bear Hills Barrens? <clears throat> well, in 1999, I first saw the fame flower um, you see here, Femoranthus teredifolium, near a footpath um, on the Bear Hills Barrens where I'd often walk and um, I was, you know, wow, this is a great little plant. And, um, you know, it's, I found out that it was rare. And um, so, um, <clears throat> but I had, after a while, I had a very simple question to ask, what else <laughs> was growing at this site? Uh, so I began to figure, well, why don't I just sort of set out a plot um, uh, of some, of, you know, to be able to study with what's going on in that plot. And so the plot was outlined by where little blue stem grass was growing. Um, and it was bordered by Virginia pine and red cedar. And when I measured it out, the plot measured roughly 550 square meters in area. Uh, <clears throat> and then I took a series of quadrats um, analyses over the years um, to determine, um, well, they were set up along a transect line so that I could go back to these same plots year after year or every few years um, to see how things are the same or changed in some way at those local spots. Um, I did that, as you can see, in the years there, 2001 through uh, last summer. Also, as I began to study this, I began to view this uh, little grassland uh, as a habitat island, um, sort of like a serpentine island surrounded by a sea of non-serpentine vegetation. It clearly was, you know, it's this little, um, you know, knoll um, with um, these unusual grasses and plants and pines and then surrounded by a normal, uh, you know, Piedmont forest with, um, of oaks and tulip tree and so forth. Um, <clears throat> to get a better idea of that, uh, looking at a geologic map, um, the, I don't know if you can see it, it may be blocked by the, uh, but uh, this little gray area here is the um, serpentine rock type. And as you can see, it's the only little gray area in this entire region uh, at least in the view of the map, and it's surrounded by um, Oella Formation, Baltimore Nice, Cockeysville Marble, and so forth. Where is Bear Hills? Just in case uh, you're viewing this from some distance and weren't sure, it's located just north of Baltimore. Um, uh, <clears throat> you can see just a little bit, about a half mile above the um, city line. 
Um, and then uh, most, many of you are familiar with Soldier's Delight, which is about 18 miles northwest um, of Bear Hills. And these are the two uh, serpentine outcrops that are in Baltimore County um, that um, and are so very, very similar as it turns out. Uh, in an aerial photo, um, you can see uh, the right the arrow here showing Lake Roland um, right here. Um, my plot is down here. I'm going to zoom in on the next one so you can see actually see it. And uh, this is a restored grassland that's, uh, that I also will talk about in the end of, the, of this talk. If we zoom in a little bit more, you can see the study plot. Um, it's a little bit more of a plot. It's still a tiny area. And it's, it's actually, it's been, you know, the pine trees have been coming in over the past I don't know, 60, 70 years and have been slowly squeezing out the last of that grassland. You can see where it's located on near Falls Road and Old Pimlico Road. So the questions I had about this uh, as I got underway was serpentine vegetation in general, of course, contains quite a, a different uh, uh, set of species in plant communities um, that's different from non-serpentine. The questions I have are what physical factors uh, or biological control what species can grow here. In other words, what is the serpentine factor? And that's, um, that's been discussed by many papers and many studies around the world. So, uh, when, you know, and, and the second question is how did these species get to this little habitat pile? The name Bear Hills, some may be familiar, familiar or curious about why uh, it's called Bear Hills. It comes from an older name, probably over 200 years at least. Um, and um, <clears throat> the, the area was actually described by a Mr. Hayden. I actually don't know his first name. Uh, but it was in because it's in a uh, this American Mineralogical Journal from uh, 1814, um, and Hayden also described the chromite mining that was, was beginning over there. Um, I just wanted to, if we zoom in on this publication again, this is from 1814, and they're quoting Hayden, uh, who's describing the area, and it says <clears throat> the eastern part of um, the Serpentine Range terminates within a small distance of the creek, which is called Jones Falls. When viewed from the summits at different points, the mind seems involuntarily to feel the impulse of melancholy. <laughs> um, for thinly scattered soil, which has been accumulating for ages, it's scarce sufficient to nourish a few scattered tufts of grass. A gloomy silence pervades. I just thought that was <laughs> that's how they're viewing uh, the bare hills at that time, 200 years ago. Uh, the person that makes the bare hills originally in the 19th century so famous was Isaac Tyson, who was a, um, a chemist and recognized the value of the chromium that was in, this, in the rock. Um, the local Baltimore Quaker, uh, he, made him, he made it fairly um, wealthy from this mining and, and not only here, but in Soldier's Delight and other places further to the north. Um, the source of the chromium was iron, a chromate of iron, iron chromium oxide. He also had a quarry going on here, a building stone. So if we look at it, take a closer look at the local geology, here's what, um, you, again, you can see there's the serpentine outcrop or, and the rock is often called serpentinite. And um, then uh, the rocks surrounding it are of a different nature. Um, and I'll show you, basically serpentine is magnesium rich. Um, and the other rocks around are um, aluminum rich and uh, calcium and so forth, but not with much magnesium. There is a little bit, but not nearly as much as in serpentine. Baltimore Nice, incidentally, uh, the green area in the map is the oldest rock in Maryland. Um, it's been dated about 1.1 to 1.2 billion years. But these rocks, the serpentine, the schist, uh, marbles, more like um, 500 to 600 million years in that range. Uh, here's a view of the serpentine, uh, serpentine or serpentine outcrop along Falls Road. And if you look at it closely, in some parts, you can see the chromiums uh, actually prominently displayed there, like the little black spots. Um, and uh, now this, what happens is when the, the rock erodes very easily and uh, the chromium then falls out of that and, and collects in sediment uh, piles uh, near the rocks and uh, it was scooped up and that was part of the, originally part of the way they got a source of chromium. Of course, they also found chromium veins and mining occurred here as well. This was the first place in North America where chromium mining began around 1810. Um, so the chemistry of the rock uh, is, so I say, is very similar to that of Soldier's Delight, perhaps uh, virtually the same as coming from the same formation or similar formations. 
Um, and chemical analysis there, uh, done in 1974 by Cleves, Fisher, and Bricker, basically uh, found that it's mostly integrite, a mineral that's magnesium silicate hydroxide. It's got magnetite in it, so it's magnetic. And, and if you can stick a little magnet up to it, you can often, uh, to the rock, you often, uh, well, you'll see the magnetism there. Um, there's chromite um, and uh, about 3% of chromite, but also includes a few other metals like nickel, lead, and zinc. I, was, I took a core in uh, earlier, a few number of years ago and report in 2009, in Soldier's Delight, and we didn't go back very far. It was, uh, we got about 200 years or so of um, time out of this, but it was enough to show that um, in um, Chromium Peak occurred around 1835, and uh, that matches up pretty well with uh, what we know historically about the Chromium mining from other reports. The greatest amount of Chromium was being uh, moved out of Soldier's Delight at 18, 1835, and then over time, it's, you know, it's less. So we, we can actually document the, uh, you know, the use of the chromium uh, supply and, and the deposition. Basically, the soil, this is, uh, as far as the plants are concerned, the soil is what we're really interested in, too, because um, you generally have thin, uh, rocky soil, rocky outcrops like you see here in the picture. Uh, the thin soil results from weathering of the antigorite by solution to, uh, to magnesium, bicarbonate, and silica, which washes away into, into the streams. What's left is a kind of a very poor grade clay called montmorillonite. And apparently it doesn't do well holding water, or if it holds water, it doesn't, it holds it so tightly and binds it that it's unavailable or not very available to plant. But when you look at deeper soils here, you do find that they are chemically less serpentine influence. You find more organic material and so forth. So as you might expect, this soil builds up. So what are the plants that we're getting here? Um, <clears throat> so I've actually uh, identified over 70 species over the course of 20 years in that little tiny plot. You know, a number of them would come like a dandelion appeared once and then it disappeared. And there are a few others that come in and go, but I've, there's this list here, is, which is uh, also included on the uh, list in the Lake Roland Nature Council uh, website that I've added here. These 45 species are ones that are uh, I've identified as pretty regular persistent species. You can count on them coming up every year when you get out to the site and you see them at that particular time. And you'll notice that I involved a few uh, rare plants, which I'll, talk, I'll, bring, I'll bring up in more detail here. Just to show you that you know, I know the theme this year has been grasses. And there's quite a few species of grasses is here and many of them are unusual. Um, Dicancelium lavicosanthes is, um, you know, considered rare. Of course, little blue stem, which is Schizocurium, is, you know, very common here and it is pretty widespread, although locally, locally common, but, and, you know, but not found everywhere around. And so, uh, same thing, we also am struck with the sedges. Having worked so long with, mostly with, in wetlands and taking cores in wetlands and understand, trying to understand the zonation that goes on wetlands. wetlands. You see carrick species is a real good indicator of wetlands. And here we've got these sedges being very important here on, on Bear Hills. I just thought that's pretty cool. You know, with a group of plants that generally are wetland oriented, that these are very dry oriented. There are also some non-native grasses that have been coming in, but they haven't, uh, with the exception of the two in bold, have not been really that important and not, they're not really sneaking in all that much. You can see Kentucky bluegrass, sweet vernal grass, uh, fescue, but the Japanese silk grass, the Chinese silver grass is moving in. I'll talk about that. And some nodding foxtail. And unfortunately, this year, this past summer, I saw black fountain grass for the first time there. Those of you who know, that's, a, that's a sort of one of the newer invasive. When you go out, I was basically going out identifying the plants when they were in bloom. So there may have been, uh, you know, there were times that it may have started growing earlier in the season, but um, I, I basically identified them at blooming time so that makes it easier to identify them for one thing but it just uh, felt like a, a way to kind of keep a consistency so in the first seven years from 2000 to 2006 these are the um, the peak and, and low points of blooming so the peak time here is around uh, June 15th and then it drops down to uh, around uh, late July early August when there's very few uh, species uh, blooming and then there's a second peak in blooming in the, in the early fall, usually around late August or September. Actually, according to these here, most of them come up in the middle of August, um, which is interesting because this was from last year. And I remember those were the first um, from 2000 to 2006. In 2020, the um, peak here is um, June 23rd. I have, um, this is when I most noticed the most species, over 20 species blooming. Uh, and then it quickly dropped. So by um, June, uh, by uh, July 24th, it was at its low point, and then it 
bounced back up again in uh, September. Notice that actually, even as late as um, September 21st, the number was high. I'm beginning to see that maybe, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a lag or delay in the peaking in the fall now. I don't know yet, that's just, just from last year. So uh, one of the things you notice before the season really gets underway, like in so any time during the winter and, or early spring, <clears throat> is, um, you know, of course, the barrenness, the, there's the dead remains of, of um, dicanthelium and so forth. But there's this algal crust. And what I've investigated, it seems to be, and it include the members in the cyanophyta, the chlorophyta, and the chrysophyta. And among the cyanophyceae, there are three genera within that group that are known to contain uh, species which fix nitrogen. And I'm, you know, I'm checking further to see if we've got that here, but uh, this would be very interesting and important for this site because uh, nitrogen fixation suggests that uh, this would be the possible nitrogen input for this nitrogen poor system. Uh, in other words, the algal crust would be the, a good supply of nitrogen to get things started on bare rock. Here is um, when it rains, the algae gets, uh, you know, absorbs it and gets spongy looking. And you can see actually some little fame flowers growing up in this here and here. Also, lots of neat little lichens on the rocks. Here's a sidewalk fire dot, dot lichen, otherwise known as, well, I've known it for long ages as Calipaca ferrocystema, but they have recently changed it to Xanthocarpia ferrocystema, but um, beautiful lichen. Um, uh, I want to go now through a chronology, uh, briefly, of about 15 species from going through March to the end of September, early October. Here's Carex umbellata, the little green thing in the center there, and you see lots of dead stems of the little blue stem grass. But basically, it's growing on this uh, barren rock. It's the first flower to bloom every year. Usually, I look for it. I, I go out in mid-March, and I don't see it. And then around the end of March, it's, you can see it blooming. One year, it came up around March 10th, and it was a particularly warm winter. So basically, though, but it is always the first one. And um, and then early, and maybe even as, and sometimes in a colder spring, it'll be a little bit like the first or second of April. Now, the thing I'm going to show you as we talk about this is where is this, uh, are these species confined just to the serpentine? And the answer as you'll see is uh, no. For example, Carex um it occurs in um, dry or moist soil, dry, sandy, rocky soil, and high elevation outcrops in non-serpentine areas as well as the serpentine. A second flower to bloom almost all, you know, without you know, without um, hesitancy, I mean, this is as predictable as <laughs> their blooming times, frankly, is the early saxifrage, now called Micranthes virginiensis. I knew it originally when I started this as saxifragia virginiensis. It too, uh, on non-serpentine uh, substrates, occurs on moist or dry open woods, rocky ledges, dry or wet rocks, gravelly open slopes, sandstone, limestone, and granite outcrops. So while it's a neat plant, and I've never seen it anywhere else, um, in my wanderings, here's, uh, you know, it, it's found on serpentine as well as other areas. Um, the next one to see blooming generally is the lyre leaf rock cress, Arabidopsis lyrata, formerly Arabis lyrata. <clears throat> it's non serpentine habitat of dry woods and fields and sandy soil, ledges, cliffs, gravel sands, limestone, and marble barrens. The serpentine chickweed, originally listed in, uh, as Cerastium arvensi. Uh, Villicissimum. Since 2003, it's been split into two different species based on DNA, or two varieties, I should say, and a new species, um, a different species based on DNA analysis. So, Cerastium uh, volutinum variety, Villicissimum, is the most recent name, and that's an endemic variety of serpentine. There is a problem, though. I have, I'm having trouble deciding or figuring out if we have this one or this one, or both. And this one is also a serpentine chickweed, but it's called variety volutinum. This is a com the, the common name is large field chickweed. And as you can see, this is not an endemic. This is uh, found on oak savannas and limestone rocks. So I'm um, gonna need to pursue that more to try to nail down if we have just the serpentine endemic, or do we have uh, this one, the large field chickweed, or do we have both on Bear Hill? The, uh, Here's a violet that always pops up. It's got the very narrow leaves. It looks at first, you might walk past and think of it as the common blue violet, but it's actually um, the arrow leaf violet or sand violet, Violiola sagittata. And it too also grows on other non-serpentine areas, sandy open woods, disturbed ground, dry open woods and thickets. By late May, early June, we see a lot of yellow in, the, in this wolf patch. And most of that is from the smalls ragwort. 
Um, Pakira Anonimo, that's undergoing a number of name changes too. It used to be Senecio Small Eye and Senecio Anonymous. It's non-serpentine habitat is meadows, dry woods, dry fields, and openings. So uh, I haven't personally identified it off of the serpentine, uh, just my own travelings, but you know, evidently it's, it's, it, it can occur in a wide variety of habitats, open, dry habitats. Okay, here's my favorite one, though, the, the fame flower, also called a rock portulaca, um, Appalachian fame flower. This Picture is in 2007, and uh, you can see that all the little plants, uh, the little succulents uh, like this here, are practically growing on bare rock. And this is why I say I'm, I'm pretty, I'm feeling pretty certain that that algae, the crust, the algal crust, is helping these species to to uh, grow here. Here's one little flower blooming. So note that it's, there's nothing else growing around them, and I think that's an uh, interesting thing to point out here. This plant is rare in Maryland. In fact, it's considered very rare. It's uh, found here, Soldier's Delight, and evidently a one granite outcrop in other part of Maryland that I understand. I haven't seen that one yet. But, um, but as you move further south down towards Georgia, uh, well, <laughs> in Georgia's where it seems to be the most common, it grows on thin, rocky, or sandy soil, usually near the edges of sandstone, granite, and, of course, serpentine outcrops. Um, here's a picture of, uh, that I borrowed from the U.S. Forest Service showing it growing on sandy substrate, you know, nothing to do with serpentine here. Um, now, this is a photo of, of a fame flower I took this past summer, and but you can see that it's surrounded now by a, this grass-like plant, which is actually Plantago aristida, the uh, bracted plantain. Yeah, you know, the non-serpentine habitat is uh, the dry open soil, dry sandy soil, prairies, dunes, and roadsides. So you have these two plants competing. Uh, what I think is happening here is that the, there's just enough other organic material here for in the, to covering these rocks for this plantain to move in. And what I would imagine is it's gonna crowd out the fame flower. I was a bit interested in this fame flower because I'm thinking is it has to do, does it have to do with pH? In other words, is maybe if it's not the magnesium or the serpentine specifically, is there something else and maybe pH? Femoranthus teredifolius is the fame flower. It can be found on sandstone, granite, and serpentine. And all of these have pHs of soils that tend to be less than seven, usually have slightly acidic. I think the average for serpentine is about 6.8, but they can go lower. Whereas in rocks that are more alkaline, above seven, pH of seven, like limestone, you find another species of closely related fame flower, we call it Thumaranthus calcareus, the um, calcareus fame flower. And uh, so I'm wondering if the acidity, the pH there is what this, spot, this plant is adapted to but not to the higher pH, don't know, throwing that out. <laughs> Another rare plant is the um, Heller's rosette grass. Uh, you can see sort of the, uh, the seed heads there and um, it, it can get fairly thick, Dicanthelium oligosanthes. Um, it's, it's, it is rare in Maryland, but it's not confined to serpentine, it's dry, sandy, thin woods and openings. It's a C3 grass, uh, whereas the Blue stemage you'll see is a C4 grass. It makes a difference in how they grow and the amount of water they need. This is the world milk wort, Oligula fertisolata. It's also found, uh, this one's one you gotta look hard to find. As you can see, it's a tiny little thing close to the ground, um, but it also occurs in cliffs, rock outcrops, meadows, and fields. This one is called the few flowered nut sedge. I think after when I, when I saw that, when I first saw the fame flower in 1999, I was looking around some more, I saw this one and this struck me as just fascinating. This, this is a sedge. It's got this beautiful white uh, uh, keen uh, uh, at the top, that very distinctive looking, but it's a sedge that, you know, here it is again, growing on very dry soil. It's also though found in grasslands, sand plains, barrens, and oak shrub lands. Um, here's a picture of this, uh, this it's called scleria. And uh, it, it, you can see at this point in July, there's not much blooming, but the scleria is sort of, is the dominant plant covering this area. This was as of last summer. Another sedge coming in in mid-August is the annual fimbri. Oops, spelled wrong there, it should be fim, fimbri. <laughs> fimbri stylus annua. This is also rare in Maryland, and but again, it's, it can occur in moist to wet substrates, as well as recently disturbed soils around temporary pools, in outcrops, savannas, and fields. And there's a close-up I borrowed from a photo taken from the Maryland Biodiversity Project website, just to show you the close-up of the, of the flower head. Okay, uh, little blue stem really becomes into its own in September, 
And by this time it reaches us pretty much its full height. It has that bluish tint to it that gives it its name. And uh, you know, it's a beautiful grass. <clears throat> and uh, but as you can see, and I'm sure many of you know, this is a, a typical prairie grass. And almost as this is why we've been often calling these serpentine uh, outcrops you know, prairies, uh, because they um, it's very, very common, for example, in northern Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas and eastern Kansas and so forth, in, in much drier part of the country. But they seem to do well in dry acid soils, fields, prairies, open woods, savannas, and cedar glades here in the eastern U.S. For me, a real surprise well, two or three years ago was the common blue curls. I, I don't have a good close-up of them, but you can see the little blue flowers there. First time I saw them at the, at the site since the beginning of the study was in 2018 where there were a few, a handful of flowers. And I noticed at that time, I, I've since looked back and saw, saw that uh, that particular summer, that particular year was incredibly wet. It was the most, I don't know if it's the wettest year or the second or third most wettest year ever recorded, but 30 inches of rain over normal. I have a feeling that had something to do with it because the next year in 2019, I didn't see it. Now I may have just not come out at the right time to see it, but it was, it, you know, it had been around for, stayed around for about several weeks this time. So I should have seen it if it was around in 2019. And there it was, the rainfall was four and a half inches below normal during the summer. So a little bit extra dry. And then it was abundant this past year, more than I've, I've seen there before. And again, and that was on September 8th, uh, when again, we had a wet year of 10 inches over normal by August. So I'm thinking, you know, there's got to be a connection here. I would hope, I would think there'd be a connection here. More water, more rainfall, then you get these um, new curls. Uh, but again, they're not confined to serpentine. They're found in dry open woods and clearings in other areas. Notice also, in the, maybe if you're looking closely at that photo, there's some ragweed. And of course, uh, the little blue stem and also some young Virginia pines that are starting to take hold. Uh, by mid-September, even towards the late part, um, we got the slender leaf gerardia and the asters. The slender leaf gerardia, Ag Agilinus tenuifolia, pretty little lavender flowered uh, that grows also in dry woods, barrens, open disturbed fields besides serpentine. And then the aster is uh, the white heath aster. Um, Symphiotricum ericoides, and it, it also can occur in open locations with sandy, gravelly, or disturbed soil. Now, when I first started this study, you know, I kind of was just putting things together and I was looking at it, and I, and I saw some lists from Soldiers Delight. I mean, I looked at lists from Soldiers Delight and all, and I said, well, this has got to probably got to be that rare aster in Soldiers Delight, you know, um, Aster de Pauperatus. But since then, we've looked at this very closely. Uh, actually, Dwight Johnson's helped me with this, and um, we seem to come down to the conclusion that this is the white heath aster, not the rare uh, aster that um, is at soldier's delight. So observations worth noting here. None of these species shown are specialists of serpentine geology, except possible exception of that endemic chickweed, Serastium. The Bear Hills flora grow in dry, sandy, gravelly, or thin soil, often on rock outcrops in a variety of bedrock type. So, the, this, so that tells me that the Bear, Bear Hills Barrens looks to be like a refuge for dry, thin soil adapted species, indicating that there may have been a much greater area of dry, thin soil habitat in uh, that, a widespread area throughout this part of the country, and that these are the remaining vestiges or refuges of these species. I'll come back to that in a second. The quadrat data that I mentioned, I basically use these one square meter plots along a transect line and, um, and so what I did in 2001 was to look at them in June and then again in September. And I know it's hard to see these, you know, at a glance, all these numbers and names of species, but just one, the ones I've highlighted are the ones that are important here. Uh, little blue stem, the Caesarium, as you notice, is, um, has the highest number, has the, these are importance values uh, that are, I have here, and it has the highest importance value in both June and September at least at this time at 2001. And then Pachyra anonyma, which is the smalls ragwort and scleria pulsiflora, which was the nutsuch, were the next most common species. And this was in, in June of 2001. In the fall of 2001, uh, the little blue stem was still the most common or, or just about the most common, but so were two, was another grass, Panicum capillary, and the fimbri stylus or the fimbri that we mentioned earlier were also very common. So, you know, if you if you were to just to try to go out one time during the summer and take some readings of it, you would miss a lot of things that are common later in the summer. 
or had come up earlier in the summer. But then what I wanted to do was to show uh, this, this, the June 2001 quadrat data with last past summer in July of 2020. And again, these are basically the same plots and say along the same transect line. And there's something that's very interesting here. So little blue stem, schizocarium is still very important, but it's dropped a bit. And the most important appears to be the, uh, now appears to be the scleria pulsiflora, the nuts hedge. And then, um, we also have some other important ones down here, the uh, Lespedeza cuneata, uh, the Japanese Lespedeza, and Microsigium pominium, otherwise you known as the Japanese stilt grass. So here we have two non-natives moving in and becoming common. So clearly here a succession is happening. We didn't have, and all the list of species here from uh, polygonal on down are, you know, turn out to be new in, in terms of the quadrats. Notice also some uh, greenbrier, well, it was common more before, but the Eupatoriums and so forth is also, and even Niscanthus sinensis is now moving in. Still, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you can see the whole thing here. So in using all those quadrats spread out through different parts of the, um, I also use in quadrats looking at different areas, the, the thinnest soil, the barren rocks and the others. I put together and then looked at the, the uh, abundance of the species and the soil depth in those plots. I came up with this. There's the rock barrens, which of course the soil depth is, you know, it's basically either bare rock with less than one centimeter in depth. And you have femoranthus, which is the fame flower, you know, the little blue stem and rabidopsis, which is the, uh, rock, the rock crest. Those three were the most common on the very thinnest soil. If you go from one to two centimeters, you get just a little bit more sediment, you get a switch so that now a little blue stem moves in but so does Smalls ragwort, Pacura, and there's the sclery of the uh, nut sedge. Add another centimeter or two or three, three to six altogether, you get scleria taking over, like I showed you in that one photo where it was covering the ground there. And now, again, remember the scleria is the nut sedge. Little, little blue stem is still common, and there's also some chickweeds in that. By the time you get to eight centimeters, though, you start seeing the pines, uh, and as well as uh, juniper, red cedar, and incidentally, the red cedar can start growing in the thinner soil, the thinner end of that uh, before the pine. So red cedar tends to be a leading tree coming out into the grassland. In the deeper soil, when you get to 12 centimeters, you can start seeing the oaks, Mer Quercus marilandica, the blackjack oak, Quercus delata, the post oak, and the pines. And then uh, greater than 12 centimeters, you see, really you can see forest trees that are very typical of the surrounding non-serpentine you know, areas, like the oaks, um, red oak, and beach and um, you know tulip trees and black cherry and all kinds of stuff like that. So I'm suggesting here that that's sort of a, a progression of succession as you add soil. And this is what you'd be seeing. And I actually am seeing this uh, between 2000 and 2020, at least in the left side of it. And then this, the further I looked at, you know, you see I, I measure the uh, size of um, the Virginia pines in relative to the amount of soil that's there. And, and basically what you're looking at here is uh, soil depth on the y-axis. And you don't really see these uh, pines showing up except um, somewhere around six, you know, six or seven centimeters. Uh, and they have diameters at that point of four or five centimeters. Um, so basically the pines need a, you know, a sediment layer of about six to seven centimeters before it can really become, take hold. So this would suggest here that if we want to continue to try to keep that grassland, we got to keep that soil depth down <laughs> so we can keep the pines out. Uh, now, I, I say fortuitously uh, almost, uh, there was a, a burn area right adjacent to my plot. This occurred at some time in late uh, in the fall or winter of 2019 or early 2020. So when I came here in March, I came I started looking in March, it was already here. And actually in April, I was struck with the, the profusion of the lyre leaf rock crest, Arabidopsis here. And so it seemed that the fire or the burn certainly was um, an encouraging factor for the growth of this plant, perhaps the release of nutrients and release of competition allowed these plants to grow. And I thought, well, this is interesting. It's going to be something to see. What's what's going to happen? Uh, you know, does this sort of support the idea of burns, of controlled burns, as maintaining these grasslands? In June, by June, uh, it started to look a little less 
unique. The tall plants in here are Eupatorium, and then there's um, ragweed coming, it's starting to come in, and some other grasses. By August, I would say this looks like a typical farm field almost. It's got the foxtail grass, uh, Eupatorium uh, altissimum coming in, and, and then here it is in September. Uh, again, uh, now the blue stem has come in, but there's a whole mess of uh, other plants, both non-native and native, that have come in here that do not look like the serpentine grassland that we usually see and look for. So uh, that does, for me, it kind of gives me, it backs up what I have observed as Soldier's Delight, which is where they've done control burns. They don't get that nice grassland coming back so much as lots of uh, green briar coming in and so forth. So I think it has to do with soil depth. If you have a deeper soil, you're not gonna get the old grasslands or the rare species. You're just gonna get more of the stuff that can grow in the deeper soil. But that's my hunch. For example, the invasion of native Virginia pine and greenbrier um, has been going on in, in this in Bear Hills here for a while. This, it was here before I came or started looking really closely. And it just is the green briar has taken over. And some places you just can't walk through it anymore. As far as the pines moving in, um, one insight we got was from that same core I was telling you about earlier uh, that I took in uh, Soldier's Delight. You can see the, the, I had a lot of pine needles in there, but it's mostly at the top of the core. And this is, um, this is measuring depth here. And then the years, there's the 1835 period linked up with the chromium release. And but you can see, Where's my uh, arrow here, cursor. You can see that uh, as you look up there that the pine needles increase around 1955. And actually that backs up some aerial photos that show pines moving into that area. And the pollen over here, uh, there it is. Um, Mark Najeko who worked with me on this, um, looked at the pollen and found it too was increasing mostly in the, in the last uh, 70 or eight, you know, years or so. Um, so that raises an interesting question. Pines have been around, but why did they start spreading around the 1940s or 50s and begin to expand quickly into and through the 1970s, 80s, and 90s and up to the modern time? Uh, an invasive that's becoming a problem at Bear Hills is Miscanthus sinensis, um, Chinese silvergrass. Um, it first invaded the open pine forest. Um, and I remember seeing it early on uh, in the open pine forest. And I began to think, well, it probably takes over in these shady, deeper soils. And so it's not going to be a problem for my study plot. <laughs> uh, well, I was wrong because by 2011, um, even though it had been under some control, uh, you know, some members of the, um, uh, the uh, Lake Roland Nature Council had tried to eradicate some of it. Uh, but it popped right back and appeared at the edge of the grassland plot in 2011. And it's now spread and dominated the shadier part of the plot uh, shown in this photo, as you can see. That was once pretty much a little blue stem grassland within the middle of these pines. Another plant that's really taken over, and this is more in the forest, uh, is the wisteria. You can see it's pretty much overwhelmed these trees. Insights that I've been gotten from this study, soil aridity, 95% of the uh, Species appear to be in dry, rocky, or sandy soils, and uh, elsewhere, um, you know, they're all, they occur in, elsewhere on non-serpentine soil. Actually, there's a name given to them. It's called the Bodenvog species. There's a species that are indifferent to the rock type where they grow. The soil aridity seems to be the most likely factor of precluding common ruberals, not so much the magnesium or other factors that may occur, like the chromium and stuff. Soil depth, uh, again, species distribution and succession is dependent upon the soil depth. And succession for the first 17 years of study, there was almost no evidence of it. I remember, as I said, coming back and not seeing it. But then the last three years, we've seen a number of changes, invasives and spreading of native grasses as well in Fantago. I'm beginning to think that a possible scenario for explaining how they could have gotten here is the fact that Bear Hill's uh, flora may have been found throughout this area in the region of Piedmont in different locations, like I have in the yellow on the left, um, in a dry soil, rocky, barren, habitats. Uh, these species would have been adapted to that kind of habitat. Over time, as climate warmed and um, or got wetter, or other changes occurred, succession, the uh, areas began to be reduced to islands and eventually to the two islands that we see here, Bear Hills and Soldier's Delight, uh, as being the last refuges of these dry species. And I'm just throwing this out and I think I want to pursue this more. It's going to be very hard to prove at this point because Dry areas are hard to find paleoecological records about them, but um, you know we're going to keep 
to keep thinking about how we can do this. So the study reveals the importance of studying a single plot year after year and find persistent species, the importance of competition um, and soil depth. For example, this little sedge can only grow, uh, it can grow there because there are no other species pushing it away. And then fire may not have been needed or as important to maintain the grassland in the past. Just want to finally, finally show a couple restoring the grassland in, in um, March 2013. Uh, these are members of the uh, Lake Roland Nature Council, the Maryland Native Plant Society, uh, a garden club or two, and other volunteers all helped to uh, begin to expand this grassland out by cutting down the pines. Six months later, you, uh, we went, uh, Charlie Davis and Dwight Johnson and I went out, and, and other people have gone out too, but we were out here looking to see what we could find, and you can see it's pretty lush. Um, there is, um, in that one corner there, left corner, the right corner, I mean, is Indian grass, which uh, is not on my, not on the plot I was telling you about, uh, but does also occur in Soldier's Delight, so that's pretty nice. Um, five years later, after the restoration, though, um, the, you can see a fair amount or a lot of Smilax, Greenbrier, coming up, and uh, this is still being needed to be controlled. I understand it's getting more controlled by some recent uh, activity, but there you have it. So that's pretty much it. I thank you for listening. Okay. Bill, thank you for a great presentation. We have lots of questions. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> the first one is... How compatible is the proposed development blue stem with the serpentine grassland? Ooh, that's a tough one. I was on that committee that was looking at that um, a couple of years ago, and um, it's hard to nail it down. Um, it just has the feeling that it's not good, but, <laughs> but trying to prove that is uh, hard. I mean, it depends on how big the Bluestone development is going to be, and if it's a six-story building that they're talking, the part of the complex they're talking about, there could be a lot more people walking through. That's going to be more disturbance. Bringing in um, more um, non-native species with seeds on their feet, whatever you know. So it would be, I would see that it would eventually. Um, the fact that this place has been so isolated and kind of um, underused has been in its favor. I would, I would predict that the development would, would speed up the succession and the disappearance of the thing flower and some of these others. But it's hard to put that down or how to describe that. Um, it's just the, you know, it's just what I think would happen, have to happen. Already the thing flower is starting to decline. Okay, our next question is, was the entire area previously mined? If so, is there any estimate of the number of species that were lost as a result? Um, yeah, well, that's, a, that's another good question because obviously those pines <clears throat> weren't there or at least they were scattered and certainly not the way they were before. And people had to bring, bring wagons through and uh, horses and you know trying to haul the rocks out. And there was an old mine there that since collapsed, um, but it wasn't, um, and then there's the quarry, the quarry, which is just a little bit north of um, Old Pimlico Road on Falls Road. You can sort of see it on both sides of the road. Um, that was heavily used um, during the 1800s. Um, in fact, the stone was used to build um, the uh, Mount Vernon uh, Methodist Church, you know, downtown, um, that green stone. Um, but um, answering your question, it's, it wasn't so everywhere. And... Um, and also a lot of the, the mining wasn't a mine so much, but a panning for the chromite. But they had better luck going to Serp Soldier's Delight and then some other places further north in the Maryland, Pennsylvania line. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I, I, I can't give you obviously an exact answer um, because people weren't recording the ecology back then other than describing it as being a place of melancholy. <laughs> um. Frank Sanford would like to know, are there more serpentine areas in Maryland? Uh, yes, and there's uh, one what, in Montgomery County, I think. And, um, and then there's uh, ones up in the northern parts of um, Baltimore and, and Harford County, uh, Cecil County. I'm not sure where is that. As, as you go up towards the Pennsylvania line, there's several um, serpentine outcrops. And then in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, there's some others. So, um, but... You know, they're spotty and they're popping out. It's all somewhat the same formation that goes all the way up um, or the same geologic event created them, we believe, all the way up to Newfoundland 
um, <clears throat> Gas Bay Peninsula down through Vermont and then um, down through here, down into North Carolina. Uh, so there are spots around, but um, Serpent, Soldier's Delight is the most important widespread uh, site we have in Maryland and uh, probably in the Eastern US for, um, that's preserved. Um, so that's, I, but what I wanted to find out from Bear Hill, since it's barely hanging in there, is you know, just how, you know, how it is and how close it is. Another talk, another time would be to compare this to Soldiers of Light. You see there's a lot of similarities. <clears throat> Okay, next we have a couple of questions relating to the changes in scientific names. What are some of the reasons for the changes and what new knowledge is driving the changes in um, genus and species names? Yeah, that's a question. <laughs> I've been complaining or you know, complaining about that for a while because uh, you know, I learned a lot of my botanical names back in the late 70s and early 1980s. And they were good for, you know, like 25, 30 years. And then all of a sudden we started having to change these names and it really is driving me crazy. Worse than that, the new names <clears throat> have like six or eight syllables as opposed to where they were just two syllables before. It's just, they made it more complicated. The reason is, is because of all the DNA progress that's been made in DNA analysis. And they can now analyze the, uh, <clears throat> um, well, they can see the genes and, and actually they realign a number of relationships. And as soon as they find that a species is not <clears throat> like the chickweed, they thought it was one species but, uh, of, uh, of Arvensi. But then they found through DNA analysis that it wasn't close to Arvensi, Serastium Arvensi, it was actually close, closer to Serastium volutinum. And, but there were two varieties and they, they, had, they um, pulled that out um, <clears throat> with DNA analysis. And I think that's true for most of these Re-evaluation. Same thing with the asters. Um, that drives me crazy now, and um, some of the other groups of plants. <clears throat> Good question. Though. I wish we could, you know, slow them down a little bit. <laughs> the next question is: Is Nostock commune part of the algal flora? One of the photos had something that looks similar. It is a nitrogen-fixing cyanobacterium. That's very possible. Like I said, I, from what I can, from what I've gathered so far, uh, the families that I gave you or cited there, um, you know, I, I'm pretty sure are, in, are included in those that algal crust. I haven't narrowed down to species yet, so it's very possibly that could be one of them. But I'm glad for the suggestion. I'll kind of follow that up a bit more. Can you please explain what C3 and C4 grasses are? Oh boy. Yeah, I almost thought, <laughs> uh, well, <clears throat> it's a photosynthetic pathway and C3 means that carbon dioxide is taken in and uh, in, the, um, in the dark reaction uh, and, and converted to a, a carbon three um, molecule. Um, in C4 plants, carbon dioxide is taken and stored in another, um, kind of stored and collected in, as another form called oxaloacetic um, acid. And then that's re-released back into this um, dark, uh, dark cycle. Uh, what does that mean? It means that C4 plants tend to be uh, more tropical and they tend to require, um, um, they can grow in hotter environments and therefore um, deal with less water and hotter environments. Um, pretty involved and it would require a lot more explanation than I'm giving you, but uh, they're basically they're photosynthetic pathways that are different and had evolved in different climates. <clears throat> Jen McBrien says, great talk, Bill. Of the plants seen on the Serpentine Barrens, what are your best picks for pollinator value? Um, <clears throat> pollinator value, you mean you're talking about insect pollinators or just what would be, did she say? No, that was um, the entirety of the question. Pollinator value. Well, um, if you're asking about uh, insect pollinators, um, I don't see too many. Uh, there are some interesting little butterflies, and there was a um, an olive hair streak that um, I think it, it actually lays its eggs in the red cedar. And there's the falcate orange tip, which always shows up every year, and I think that feeds on the uh, mustards on the on the rock cress. Um, but um, you don't see bees much at all. Um, what you have, <laughs> I don't get pollinators, what we have the most troubles with are uh, chiggers uh, by, 
by June, um, we uh, that's a it's a huge annoyance, and those are everywhere, and the grass is there. But um, you know, so I don't have. I'm not sure how to answer your question there, but um, there are so there are some interesting butterflies and uh, other insects, <clears throat> and I know there's an ongoing study of the insects there. I think the, the Nature Council has more information on that. <clears throat> Another question is, how do you determine an importance value? I think this question came in when you were talking about uh, the most important plants in your right. life. Well, what you do, you take a, when you have a quadrat, a, a, a square area, squared off one meter by one meter, and, I, and you note the, or uh, I note the, the uh, relative plant coverage. So let's just say the plant covers uh, 80, 80% of the of the, that little plot, you would give it a you know an 80% um, value. Then, um, so you want to look at plant cover, and then let's say I have 10 plots, and I find it I find it in five of the 10 plots. I don't find them in all 10. Well, then it has a um, a frequency of 50%. It's 25 out of 10. You add the frequency and the cover together to give it the importance value. So some species are so widespread that you get them in all 10 plots, and that's going to increase its importance but also, you know, not only its dominance within the plot, but also spread out. <clears throat> okay, one questioner would like to know, is there a verbascan stem in the photo of little blue stem? Yes, <laughs> verbascan blateria, the moth mullen, yeah. Yeah, in fact, I saw a few more this year than I've seen in the past few years. It was much more common when I first started looking there and, um, and it's kind of faded away Interestingly, and I, one thing I didn't mention here too, besides the, um, that, the moth mullen, which is non-native, but um, the knapweed um, was pretty common. Uh, no, well, was, there was a number of plants, maybe 20 or 30 plants there in the uh, plot, in the whole plot in the early parts of the 2000s, but I hardly see it at all now. It's getting crowded out or something's changing in it. It's just not showing up. So here you think this invasive is coming in, it's taking over the Western prairies um, is uh, not, not doing well here. Our next question is, what has kept the soil so thin in areas of the Serpentine Barrens? If fire isn't the meaning, maintaining factor of the grassland, what do you think was? Possibly grazing, American bison, and later introduced ruminants? Oh, that's a good one. I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, I, I'm not going to say that fire isn't important. It may have been important at one point. I, I've tried to look for cores, um, coring sites, and look for charcoal near these areas to see if I could support the fact that there were more fires here. And I know that Emily uh, Russell Southgate, um, she did a study about this and didn't find nearly as many fires, if I recall her paper correctly, um, as was as people had talked about. So I am beginning to think that the fire is not as important uh, an issue, uh, even though it's used to kind of explain the presence of these grasslands here, I think it was something more than that. I think it is the, the rock, when it, unlike other rocks uh, like granite or, um, or even the schists and so forth, they'll, when they dissolve, they form a clay. Um, they have aluminum silicates in them and they form these clays. And um, whereas when um, uh, serpentine is exposed to you know, ra normal rainfall, um, it kind of dissolves away, it kind of washes away and it leaves a very small residue behind. So I just think it's still here as a barrens because it's, uh, it's so slow in producing a soil um, and, and remains barren and open for long time periods. Have you seen Asclepius verticillata? Yes, I didn't include that on this, uh, but in fact, just this past summer, uh, summer of 2020, um, there was one or two plants there. Yes, that's a neat one, little milkweed. Yeah. Have you published your findings anywhere? That's what I'm in the process of doing now. So <laughs> I'm hoping to pull it together uh, this summer and, uh, and support, you know, report on some of the things here that you've heard today. But uh, yeah, I do, the only other thing I do have, uh, like I say, I have the paper, which I've listed here on the, um, under the credits, um, myself and Martin Jaco and Ryan Casey from Towson University, we did a study and reported in 2009 um, 
and basically we were looking at the impact of uh, the pines coming in and you know what we could tell from that and the metals and the soil depths. Um, so, and the conclusion from that paper, uh, which I, gets back to what we've been talking about, is that clearly, uh, if you want to maintain the habitat for fame flower and for some of the other rare ones, the fimbri, um, you know, the, the, you need to have very thin soil, and it may mean coming in and scraping the soil back, um, you know, not just cutting pine trees down, and not just burning, but literally scraping the, um, the soil back to the you know the bare rock practically. Of course, in doing that, you probably scrape away the seed bread bank and everything else. So I don't know. That's you know, it's a complicated thing. I, I know that um, Roger Latham, who's been a consultant with the Nature Council, and working with uh, designing um, you know restoration at at Bear Hills, um, uh, has done more with that. And I think he agrees agrees that if you're going to you have to reduce the soil level to really bring those species back. A related question is how would you propose to reduce soil depth without removing plant reservoir materials? Yeah, that's, that's what I would say. I, I, that's a tricky one. I don't know how we would do that. Um, you know, I think a little bit of um, engineering is involved here <laughs> to, to figure out how you could both reduce the soil depth and still retain some of the, uh, you know, the original seed uh, bank and other plants that are in that. Like for example, where in the world do those blue curls come? If, they, if I'd never saw them before 2018, suddenly they appear. Were they dropped in by, by birds, the seeds, or did they, were they sitting in the ground dormant until the wet, wetter year that we had in 2018 allowed it to spring up? And you know, that's another one of those questions I love asking. I don't have any answers for, but. So uh, I don't know how important the seed bank is in these dry uh, sediments, but I imagine like the fame flowers as a, as a perennial, it just keeps coming up each year. Um, so if you tore the seed, you know, if you tore back the uh, sediment and you tore back those, the basis, you know, the roots of those, then you wouldn't have the fame flowers anyway. So um, it's a tricky one. And I'm just saying that that's the only way to retain, I can see to really retain fame flower and barren rock um, flora is to really reduce that soil level. I don't know how we can do that. Why is greenbrier considered so undesirable? That's terribly thorny and, uh, and, it, and it grows so thick in some places in Bear Hills and also in, um, gosh, in Soldiers of Light, you can't move through it without, I mean, it's just literally, it would tear at you and you just can't get through it. And it's very aggressive. And so you open the, you know, you cut down the pines and you open it up and um, you, know, you burn it and greenbrier just spreads like crazy. It spreads, I think, by runners as well as the berries it can be dispersed by birds. And so I, you notice I call it an invasive. It's, it's a native plant, but it acts like a uh, non-native invasive. In fact, it takes over and pushes out other species. So I don't like it. Um, and that's, that's, <laughs> that's why. <clears throat> um. In response to one of your previous answers, Judy Fulton says, I am growing blue curls not that far away. Maybe the seeds were transferred by birds. That's, that would be, that'd be great. Uh, you say you're growing them? You, did you plant them? Um, oh, she doesn't well, know. <laughs> I can't can't answer, so. okay. Assuming that she says she's growing them means she's, uh, I assume she's planted them. Um, which well, would be great. I'll put you two in touch afterwards. Yeah, right. We'll have to do that. <laughs> Please send me an email, and that'd be great. Um, I I'll try to send that um, to you so that you can follow up. Okay. Was the area ever grazed by stock animals? Is there evidence of current animal grazing? No current. Um, uh, I don't have any evidence from those early writings that it was ever used for that. I don't know. It, it could very well have been a part. I know Soldier's Delight, it was. Grazing was, was part of it. I don't know how much grazing. Uh, there's no numbers about like number of head of cattle or whatever to kind of give you a better idea. But people, there are some historic accounts of some grazing going on to Soldier's Delight. I don't know if any was here. I think the mining started here really early, like in the, uh, you know, like I said, early 1800s. And, um, and I think that just would have precluded grazing if they're all working in the mines there. 
Um, the next questioner says, I thought native grasses had deep roots. How can little blue stem and Indian grass grow in these situations? Is it lateral movement of roots? Well, I do see them in clumps, um, but that's a good question. That would be a good master's uh, degree uh, <laughs> pursuit in terms of figuring out exactly how they spread. Um, I do think, um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, they're, they seem to be perennials. They keep popping up each year. They die back, uh, but they keep popping up each year in the same areas. Um, so I think it's rhizomes and it may be roots, but you're right, the thin soil, how in the world does it do it? It's, and um, yeah, I don't have an answer for you on that one. Someone else would like to know whether you're planning research to further investigate um, the hypotheses that you mentioned. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I would like to um, see if really there were more, um, I, I'd like, I, in other words, what this is leading me to think is that these, this dry, um, somewhat rock barren type of habitat was much more widespread at some point in the past. Um, and that over the past 10, 15,000 years, and I'm just pulling those numbers out right now, um, that, those, that habitat has dwindled. Uh, and then of course, probably disappeared even more when European settlement came in and started uh, just doing further disturbance um, from land clearing and other things. And um, so I would love to find that out. I, one thing that leads me to think that there's something to this idea is um, some people I've been working with up in um, Franklin Marshall College have documented the fact that we were, uh, this area of Maryland was under permafrost during the last late glacial period. And um, there's also evidence you have from cores in Lancaster County that show um, there seems to be no plant, no plant material. No, um, so there, was, there could have been um, maybe late glacial 20,000, 15,000 years ago um, when there was a lot of exposed barren landscape um, that, um, you know, following the glaciers. And then of course the permafrost melted and, uh, and little by little as things warmed up, those areas underwent succession, forests moved back in and crowded out these dry areas. That's my hunch. Um, I'd love to be able to sort of support that with evidence. So yes, that's an area I'd like to continue. Okay, someone else would like to know whether there is any utility in preserving the blackjack oaks and post oaks since they're rare this far north. Um, well, I, I guess that's an interesting question because uh, you're right, they are they're fairly uncommon here. I, I'm not sure you can call them rare. Uh, post oak is more common than the blackjack. And, uh, but then of course the blackjack and uh, oak is spreading out in the prairies and like in Oklahoma and Kansas. Um, and it's uh, post oak has been pretty widespread through out towards the West as well. So it's not a rare plant. It's rare, it's uncommon in Maryland, but it's not you know, rare overall. I don't know. Um, I know that the, 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 the attempts of um, restoration at Soldier's Delight have preserved the blackjack oaks. While they burn and cut back the pines, they leave the oaks. So I guess that could be part of the thinking is that, you know, it's an unusual tree, should be preserved. Um, there are a lot more questions and we are not going to get to them all. But there are a couple of questions related to invasives, whether anyone is doing invasive removal and whether there's been any investigation of biocontrols for invasive plants. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about uh, the biocontrols. Um, like I said, uh, there's been some attempts at trying to pull back to um, uh, spray uh, the, um, an herbicide on the um, Chinese silvergrass. I know that's been done. Um, but some of the other invasives, you know, like the Japanese stilt grass and there's Japanese barberry, uh, there's ailanthus trees growing up in, in the pine forest. Um, you know, there's just a lot of uh, non natives, mostly uh, Asian origin, uh, or <laughs> of origin, uh, uh, that are um, spreading. Um, and um, I'm not, there's no real attempt at that, this point that I know of about trying to remove them other than the silver grass. Um, <clears throat> and uh, again, um, I know with the restoration site that I showed you in the end, um, 
that um, the Greenbrier has been a problem. Um, I don't know about other non-natives coming in. So I think more could be done. Uh, you have to be careful. I, I sort of feel like I have to be, you have to have a balance here because if you start doing spraying or doing too much, you might actually damage some of these delicate little plants that are growing there. So, you know, you have to be, um, you have to be mindful that maybe we just have to come back and cut the stuff back periodically, dig it up where we can, um, but that we're gonna be dealing with it for years to come. Um, a lot more questions have come in um, on the basis of some of your answers. And I'm sorry, everyone, we are just not going to get to them all, but we'll take one more. Lauren Brown would like to know whether you think that the Smilax is encouraged by fire. Uh, good question, Lauren. Um, <clears throat> well, um, there seems to be, uh, yeah, I, I would say when you, uh, at Soldier's Delight, after they've done the, those burns, particularly in the areas where there were more uh, deeper soils, um, if Smilax just grows back as fast as any plant I've seen. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if it's encouraged by fire. Um, certainly, as you saw that one picture I showed you, it's just spread throughout that little grassland. And it's been a problem for the um, Nature Council to try to keep that, or the restoration people to keep that under uh, control. Um, I, I, I remember years ago, I talked to Jim Hall, who was at Towson University, um, who was studying uh, Soldier's Delight. And um, he believed that you needed to burn the area twice in succession to kill more of the Greenbrier, that one, one fire alone only just one promoted it and two fires would actually kill it back. I don't know. I don't know where he was basing that on, but um, yeah, I think that's a good, good point. It could be. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Bill, thank you for a fascinating presentation. 